Yes, sir. Okay, docs. The recording is on. And can you see my slide? Is everybody happy to see my slide? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, good, good. And can you hear me well? Is yes, the voice sir. voice clear or no? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So today we are going to talk about solitary pulmonary nodule. Uh, it's it's a topic where uh, a lot of people get confused. It's quite a simple thing, uh, really, to look at it. But there are so many guidelines out there that it is actually very confusing to know which guideline to follow and what to say in the exam and things like that. So today I'll try and uh, walk you through some basic guidelines and uh, we'll try and understand what to do when you're faced with a patient with a solitary pulmonary nodule. Because the philosophy of the whole thing is, of course, that you don't want to miss malignancy. That is why solitary pulmonary nodule becomes very important because, uh, you know, an innocuous looking little nodule on the lung may actually turn out to be lung cancer. And uh, if you miss it uh, or you don't treat it according to the guidelines or protocols, then uh, the chances are that uh, the patient may end up with having metastases and that would be a huge disfavor to the patient. Hence, this topic is quite important. So today I'm going to try and go through a few guidelines with you. Um, but uh, the main guideline that I'm going to look at is ACCP guidelines, which is American College of Chest Physicians. Uh, but BTS has also given out a pretty good document. But the problem with the BTS document is it's a very complex document to read through. It's not an easy read. So it's kind of difficult to understand exactly what they are saying. So there are the, so I've taken up important things from the BTS in, and mainly concentrating on the ACCP. So the BTS document starts with some very nice questions that they ask. Whenever you are faced with a patient with a solitary pulmonary, pulmonary nodule, what are the questions that come to your mind and how do you answer them? And so my talk today will go through this. So the root of presentation and the clinical context of the nodule, does it make any difference in SPN characteristics? Which means is it an incidentally detected nodule or are you doing a follow-up uh, lung cancer screening where you found a nodule? So we're going to try and answer the question. So what are the different characteristics of a nodule in different clinical scenarios? Uh, we will look at what are the techniques of CT, what is recommended by the international guidelines. So what are the technical considerations for nodule detection on chest X-ray and CT scans? We will look at what are the technical cons considerations in a benign nodule? Uh, how can you tell the, whether a nodule is benign and how can you actually discharge the patient from follow-up. Uh, we will look at CT surveillance of a patient. We'll try and answer the question whether is it appropriate, uh, in what situations do you need to do CT surveillance? Um, how should you, how should it be done? You know, whether it should be done three months, six months, nine months, all these questions are there and I'll try and answer these questions through the, through the talk. And um, if there is anything that is not clear, we can always go back to the whole, okay? I also will talk about how useful are other imagings in uh, nodule evaluation and when should you use other imaging over and beyond chest x-ray and CT scans. Um, we will talk uh, about non-surgical biopsies. We'll talk about what are all the tests available for non-surgical biopsies. When should you use it and what are the problems with non-surgical biopsies. Uh, we will concentrate on surgical biopsies, uh, when to undergo surgical biopsy, how should it be done and what are the harms? And of course, uh, I'll talk at the end uh, about treatment without pathology. So sometimes you have a solitary pulmonary, solitary pulmonary nodule deep in the parenchyma of the lung and you don't know what to do because you cannot get pathology. So what should you do in that scenario? Should you operate on this patient uh, or should you just follow them up by CT screening and things like that? So we'll try and address these questions, okay? And so let's start the talk first by defining what's a solitary pulmonary nodule. So a solitary pulmonary nodule is anything that's less than three centimeters. That's the first important thing, okay? So there are two or three important numbers that will come and I'll highlight them as we go along. So the first important number is three centimeters or 30 millimeters. It should be surrounded by normal lung. That is very important, okay? That is the definition of a solitary pulmonary nodule. 
there should be absence of pleural effusion. If there is pleural effusion, this is not an SPF. Okay, this is a disease beyond. There should be absence of lymph nodes. That's also very important. There should not be any lymphadenopathy. If there is lymphadenopathy, then you are going down the route of evaluation for lung cancer. That is a completely different scenario. There should be absence of atelectasis in other lobes of the lung. So it's very difficult if you've got an SPN in one lobe and then atelectasis in the rest of the lung or in the same lobe. That completely muddles the picture. So solitary pulmonary nodule, all the guidelines will talk about absence of all these things. Only the single solitary nodule, which is uh, less than three centimeters. And of course, we do this by chest X-ray and CT scan. It's incidentally found, okay? Very often it's incidentally found. And uh, the incidental finding ratio is not 0.09 to 0.2% of all scans. So not really uh, a huge percentage, but if you look at the number of CT scans and chest X-rays done across the world, then this becomes a significant number. So a really high number of patients over the years, you will see who will come up with solitary pulmonary nodules. And then you have to decide because you're taking the responsibility for these patients. Uh, if you tell the patient that I'm going to follow you up in six months, then you're actually taking the responsibility to make sure that this guy is not going to get cancer in six months. And that is the worry. That's why you need to understand the guidelines very clearly. And that's why you need to follow the guidelines so that in case you do have a patient who has, uh, you know, a progression of a disease, the patient cannot uh, come back and sue you or take you to court because you have followed the guidelines. And if the guideline says so, then you are safe. So that's why it's important. Uh, solitary pulmonary nodule can be divided into two types. Okay. So on one side is the solid nodule. And on the other side is a subsolid nodule. A subsolid nodule is again further divided into two types. It's part solid nodules or a pure ground glass nodule. And it's very important to understand what are these three types. A solid nodule, what does it look like? A part solid nodule, what does it look like? And a pure ground glass nodule, what does it look like? Because it changes the uh, situation. So this is the definition on the BTS guidelines, and I'll take you through this definition in more detail, okay? So when we are talking about a solid SPN, we're talking about part of a nodule, or we're talking about the whole nodule that obscures the underlying bronchovascular structure. This is the definition of solidity. So on a CT scan, when, I, when you tell me this is a solid nodule, and I ask you, what do you mean by a solid nodule? What it means is that the underlying bronchovascular structure cannot be seen, something like this. So here is a nodule. You can see the bronchovascular structure in the rest of the lung. Everything quite clear. But here, you cannot see the underlying bronchovascular structure. And so that is why this nodule is called as solid. Anything that causes this, whether it's calcification or whether it's cancer, all of it will take away the vision of the underlying bronchovascular structure, the normal bronchovascular structure. And it's very, very important to understand this. What is a solid nodule? The next thing that is that comes into the picture is a part solid nodule. So a part solid nodule is a focal op opacity with both solid and ground glass component, but less than three centimeters. Okay, that's a subsolid nodule, something like this. So you can see a ground glass. You can see the solid component. If you look into the ground glass, you can see behind the ground glass. But in this, in the solid component, you cannot see behind the ground glass. And then the third part that comes into the picture is a ground glass op opacity. So how do you define a ground glass opacity? It's usually a focal opacity, less than three centimeters, but there is opacification, but the opacification is more than the background. However, it does not obscure the background vascular pattern. That's the most important thing. So there is opacification more than the background, but it does not obscure the background vascular pattern. So here it is. So here you can actually see the lung structure going through it, but you still know that the opacification is more than the surrounding. So this is a classic ground glass opacity. 
okay it's very 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 important to understand the three because each one of them has a different significance and a different style of managing the nodule okay so what is the etiology where do you get uh, solid pulmonary nodules so there are multiple etiologies of solitary pulmonary nodule and we'll go through each one of them in a little more detail so it could be congenital very often you might have an av malformation and that's not a problem av malformation can be treated but it's not malignant the whole key of all of this is to understand what is a malignant uh, spm you can have a mucosin or you can have what is called as the osler weber rendu syndrome okay and i'll talk about that in a minute i'll show you some pictures the other benign etiologies can be bacterial so it can be infection with an abscess which can be either due to bacterial can be secondary to book can be secondary to a fungal infection like aspergilloma actinomycosis coccidiomycosis histoplasmosis okay so this is a benign avm you can see that though this is slightly more than 3 cm but i just put it in there to show you what a benign avm will look like this is quite classical and this looks like there is something uh, lobulated uh, happening within this nodule and this is a classical picture of a benign avm now something like this i am not worried i know this is uh, going to turn out to be an avm this is not cancer and i'm quite happy but it's important to know what are the characteristics now a lung abscess may look like this picture a okay the important characteristics of a lung abscess is that you have to do serial cts and they resolve that's the important thing with lung abscess so anything that resolves is not cancer cancer does not resolve cancer is always progressive hence uh, you have to uh, identify the the pathology very clearly look here you can actually see an air fluid level within this and an air fluid level within a cavity is usually a suggestion that this is collection within a cavity and so this is probably a lung abscess who is this writing okay then what about a benign something like an aspergilloma this is classical this is an aspergilloma and you can very clearly see this fungal ball within the aspergilloma something like this i'm not worried about it i know this is aspergilloma highly unlikely to be um, malignancy and i can carry on with this fact okay uh, the other types of benign uh, solitary pulmonary nodules that you will see are inflammatory nodules which could be intrapulmonary lymph nodes could be lymphoid tissue could be granulomatous nodules secondary to tuberculosis histiocytoma plasma cytoma particularly in the us plasma cytoma is pretty common in certain areas uh, rheumatoid nodules can actually cause a problem because you see the rheumatoid nodule and you don't know whether this is cancer or not or sle so the history is very important you've got to take a very good history to actually correlate the clinical findings with the history and that's that will help you identify very often what is a benign and what's a malignant nodule the other uh, etiologies are autoimmune so autoimmune could be sarcoidosis amyloidosis histiocytosis x or it could be pseudo tumors uh, blesowski syndrome uh, which is an infolding of the lung uh, also called as rounded atelectasis or there could be scarring from previous uh, other infection or tuberculosis etc okay uh, ischemic lung can actually present itself as a as a solitary pulmonary nodule but these are all benign okay the ones that i have spoken so far are all benign uh, you can have developmental problems like a hamartoma uh, you can have an hemangioma you can have a small bronchogenic cyst but most of the bronchogenic cysts usually are present more on the medial side of the lung rather than in the periphery uh, you can have a lung sequestration so if you look at the list of benigns it's a pretty long list but the good thing about benign is that all of these things which i spoke about have typical characteristic characteristic features on radiology which will help you to diagnose what you're dealing with uh very often you see calcifications within these nodules uh, which are usually a benign pattern so the calcification can be diffuse as in the whole nodule can be calcified it can be a central calcification 
it can have what is called as a laminated pattern or it can have a popcorn pattern so this is the all of these when they are present they are more suggestive that you're dealing with a benign disease rather than a malignant disease so something like this okay so this is a central calcification this is a rim of a calcification this is complete calcification and that's a popcorn can you see that all four of them are different one two three and four all of them are different and they represent this different types of pattern and more often than not if you see calcification you are more likely to be dealing with a solitary pulmonary nodule of benign origin rather than malignant origin so quite important to see this and understand what is the diagnosis of this lung infarction will show you the blood vessel going into that area so this is a good picture which tells shows you the vessel going into that area and then sudden cut off and always it's a triangulated piece rather than a circular lung infarctions are usually triangulated because uh, it it spreads out so it's it's quite a classical diagnosis the moment you see a ct of a lung infarction there is no question of 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 a uh, differential diagnosis it's very classical and sometimes if you look carefully you will see the thrombus can you see the thrombus here carefully there is the contrast study there is no blood going into that and then here is an isophic uh, here is the infarction distal to it so it's not just the nodule but you got to look at the whole picture to understand what exactly is the pathology that is happening uh, hematomas are very classical in their opinion they are nicely circulated that's the most important thing they have very good uh, capsule on it and then inside maybe lobulation maybe calcification etc but the moment you see a ct scan with a nicely sent, uh, lobulated thing it's usually a hematoma but of course metastasis can look the same so you got to be careful to be able to differentiate the two and uh, so that we'll talk about in a minute we spoke about blesowski syndrome this is a blesowski syndrome this is called as rounded atelectasis where there is infolding of the lung see this and it presents itself as an spn but the important thing is look at the whole picture you will see areas of atelectasis going out here and usually it is in the periphery of the lung so this is a blesowski syndrome but of course you cannot dismiss it you still have to follow it up with ct scan to make sure that you you are you are dealing with the correct pathology because the last thing you want is uh, insidious lung cancer missing your uh, eye okay bronchogenic cyst as i told you is usually more medial more central uh, and it will be seen uh, within the parenchyma or along with the uh, airways so you have to follow the airways on the ct and you will see uh, a bronchogenic cyst now what about malignant this is the one that's more worrying for you this is the one that you really need to know but we cannot talk about malignant until and unless you identify what is benign so it is important to see a lot of cts of benign structures and then see a malignant structure and that will actually help you so malignant can be primary lung cancer okay so it can be non small cell lung cancer it can be small cell lung cancer or it can be a carcinoid now i have put carcinoid into a malignant group because carcinoids are potentially Uh, have a potential to undergo metastasis so no carcinoid should be thought of as a benign disease i think that's a huge mistake a lot of people do when they are discussing with patients as well they call it a benign disease carcinoids are not benign disease there is typical carcinoid atypical carcinoid so these are not benign disease and which carcinoid will undergo an atypical change is almost impossible to predict that is why you should not treat carcinoids as a benign disease okay so that's primary lung cancer you can have secondary you can have multiple metastases coming from elsewhere and the common metastases to the lung the commonest one is colon 30 to 40% of colonic uh, cancers metastasize to the lung you can have kidney breast prostate thyroid skin melanomas frequently metastasize to the lung or you can have a long bone sarcoma okay many times sarcoma is uh, present as a single isolated metastasis in the in the lung or multiple metastases in the lung and you need to be able to know uh, how to pick these up how to diagnose them and more importantly how to treat them okay so when you're looking at lung cancer this is a view of the lung cancer this is classical because there are speculated things coming out 
It's an irregular margin and there is central density. This is typical of lung cancer. Uh, you can have a metastasis. Usually metastases are more rounded. They are more circular in, uh, uh, in origin rather than having uh, the speculated metastasis which you saw in the previous slide. And they, are, they may be single or they, be, they may be multiple. So this is classical and they usually are along the pathway of the blood vessel. So if you look carefully, there will be blood vessels leading to that because they come via blood. They don't come via uh, uh, local implantation or local spread. They come, they are hematogenous spread. Usually metastases are in hematogenous spread in the lung. So if you look carefully, you will see the blood vessels going towards the metastasis. So that, that sort of gives you an idea as to what you're dealing with. And then of course, multiple metastases. This is not a single pulmonary nodule. This is multiple metastases. But sometimes in your clinical practice, you will have more than one nodule in the lung and you will not know what to do. So today I'll talk about what are the guidelines for multiple nodules in the lung. What should you do in that clinical scenario? Okay. So this is a sort of a synopsis of all, everything that I spoke. This is from uh, American College of General Practitioners who have uh, published this, uh, the ACCP guidelines for their local uh, audience and so these are the common ones that they have highlighted and so you should be able to differentiate between the two it's very 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 important and uh what about clinical features so what what are the clinical features May very often these guys will be asymptomatic because did you raise your hand okay very often these guys there are, are people who are not able to lab guru lab guru Lab Guru Vikas. So very often there are guys who are asymptomatic. Uh, smoking may be a feature of these guys. Usually a lot of people will present with hemoptysis. Uh, if it is associated uh, close to a blood vessel, the patient may have constitutional symptoms. Um, a drug history, cocaine history is known to be uh, associated with solitary pulmonary nodules either because of tricuspid regurgitation and back pressure or because of uh, pulmonary embolism or because of infarcts, okay? Uh, the age status is quite important. People with low immune deficiency are more likely to get uh, either malignancy or inflammatory or infective nodules in the lung. Uh, you have to look for travel history, particularly when you're talking about uh, fungal infection because certain fungal infections are more common in certain areas. Uh, and of course, not to forget hydrated, but hydrated doesn't come as an SPN. So usually in a differential diagnosis, we don't talk about hydrated in the SPN. Uh, you've got to look at occupational exposure. It's very, very important. You've got to find out whether the patient has a history of occupational exposure. Uh, you've got to ask for extra pulmonary malignancy. So in the history taking is very, very important in an SPN. So whether the patient had previous colonic cancer operated or previous uh, renal cancer operated. And the history of previous mediastinal radiotherapy because mediastinal radiotherapy can form, can predispose the lung to have a uh, sarcoma in the lung. So primary sarcoma of the lungs can happen secondary to radiotherapy exposure. So it is important to ask for history of previous mediastinal radiotherapy. And then you can you have to ask for paraneoplastic syndromes, uh, things like SIADH uh, and stuff like that uh, to rule out the uh, to rule out the carcinoid uh, phenomenon. Okay, so it's quite important. So what are the risk factors for lung cancer? So all of this we understand, but the key thing is we have to understand in the history when should your uh, you know your sensors be raised when you are seeing a solitary pulmonary nodule. So age actually is a risk factor. The older you get, the more likely you are to have a solitary pulmonary nodule. More likely you are to actually uh, have a malignant change in a solitary pulmonary nodule. Smoking history, we all understand very clearly. Uh, it is directly correlated with primary lung cancer. Uh, disease history, the symptoms are important. So whether the patient has got cough, if he's got cough, fever, rigors, then there are more chances that it is inflammatory rather than infective. The disease history is very important. The pattern of the disease, how far is it going? The family history is quite important because people with previous family histories will have a high risk for lung cancer. Within the disease history, you have to look for malignant neoplasms. 
Uh, COPD and fibrosis predisposes, uh, reduces the immunity of the patient and can predispose to malignant change. Now, this is the key thing that you have to understand. Exam going people, please write this down because we actually ask you in the exam, what are the quantitative and qualitative models for predicting malignancy in a solitary pulmonary nodule? This is an MCQ, okay? So there are three models that are available. In fact, there are many models that are available, but the guidelines that have looked at, particularly the uh, BTS has looked at uh, Mayo Brox predictor model. They call it the Brox predictor model. Uh, the Americans, the ACCP guys and the ACGP guys have looked at Mayo predictor model and have looked at VA predictor model. VA is the Veterans Administration Hospital. These are types of hospitals which are specifically for the uh, the war war uh, you know it was started as hospitals for uh, war returnees but uh, they are a different set of hospitals and then the herder prediction model is also used in the bts guidelines so it is important to remember these three names okay we will ask you how did you predict the presence or absence of malignancy in a solitary pulmonary nodule and you have to say, I used a predictor model. And what is a predictor model? This is the predictor model. The predictor model actually gives you the odds ratio for a solitary pulmonary nodule, which is likely to be malignant. That is the important thing to remember. So the VA, the Veterans Affairs model, looks at nodules more than seven millimeters. And each one of these risk factors, which I told you, is actually given a odds ratio. And depending upon the odds ratio, if this is present and an SPN is present, this is the risk of getting uh, things. So it's a, it's a very nice tool which actually helps you evaluate the risk of having malignancy in a solitary pulmonary nodule. This definitely will come up as an MCQ or in a discussion. When you put up a CT scan with an SPN, I'll tell you what is the, uh, what is the model that you're using for predicting the risk of malignancy in this SPN. And so you have to use this model. Okay, it's quite important. And this is directly from the paper, ACCP and ACGP paper. Okay, so quite important to understand that. All right, now let's look at the other part of things. So what do you do in examination? It's very important to do a good clinical examination because a lot of uh, things will actually tell you uh, what to think of. So clubbing is associated with lung cancer, bronchiectasis, AVM. Uh, cyanosis, skin nevi, lip telangitis, CIA, pulmonary murmurs are with Osler Weber Rendu syndrome, which is usually associated with pulmonary AVM. So, clinically, if you are looking at a patient and you find any of these and you find a nodule on the lung, then the chances are there is more likely to be a pulmonary AVM. Uh, heart murmurs is seen in drug abusers with tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, always look for weight loss and cachexia because there could be other malignancy which is sent a metastasis to the lung. Uh, don't forget epistaxis and skin lesions can suggest vasculitis. Vasculitis can present with an SPN in the lung. Uh, scars of previous malignancy surgery. So somebody who's had a colectomy and you've got a lesion with a, uh, with a lesion in the lung, then high chances that this is a metastasis from a colon rather than, uh, rather than uh, a primary lung or a benign disease. So this is what we were talking about, clubbing. This is uh, Osler Weber Rendu syndrome, uh, pulmonary AVMs. You can look here clearly, there's a pulmonary AVM. Um, malignancy, cachexia of malignancy is very important when you are dealing with uh, solitary pulmonary nodules. Uh, previous scars of previous surgery, very important. Always do a full, systemic examination, your case, your long case in the FRCS may be an SPN and the patient may not have any symptoms in the chest. That is the real problem. When you, when you got a case like that and you have just examined the chest and not taken off uh, and not looked at his abdomen or looked at his back, whether he's had anything or you've not asked a history of prostate surgery, you're likely to miss the diagnosis. And, and, you know, the whole history is normal, 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 because this was incidentally picked up for SPM. Uh, and unless and until you ask that dedicated history, you will completely miss the cause of the SPM. And then you'll put up a CT scan and you will say, this is a 
hematoma and that will be a complete disaster. So very, very, very important in the FRCS exam. If you get a patient who's giving you all normal histories, then you're thinking about an SPN. And when you're thinking about an SPN, remember these pictures which I've shown you. It's quite important. I've put this up specifically to give you subtle hints as to what else will tell you the cause of the SPN. Okay, very, very, very important. Okay, so what are the technical considerations when we do a CT scan or a chest X-ray? A simple chest X-ray, anybody can read it. We know that there is a SPN. You have to read it very carefully because very often these are very subtle changes. So if somebody throws an X-ray at you in the exam, which is looking relatively normal, it's highly unlikely that I will give you a normal X-ray in the chest exam. Highly, highly unlikely. So the one thing if you've got to look for, if you see a potentially normal looking chest X-ray is, am I missing a solitary pulmonary nodule? Because it could be a ground glass opacity. And a ground glass opacity is very difficult to see on a chest X-ray until and unless you've seen tens or fifteens or twenty chest X-ray with a ground glass. So very important to look carefully. Look within the parenchyma very carefully and you will usually pick up the lesion because nobody in the exam will give you a chest X-ray with no uh, with, with a normal chest X-ray. It has always got to be some pathology somewhere. So if you potentially have a chest X-ray which is normal, look for SPN. Very, very, very important point. Remember this. Uh, point when you go for exams. Now this is multiple nodules. You can see that this is quite clear, not a problem. You can you can very easily pick this up. So when the chest X-ray comes positive, what are the uh, tests to be done? Well, normally the first test to be done after a positive chest X-ray with an SPN is an HRCT, an HRCT with multiplane reconstruction. Okay, that's quite important. Uh, if it is benign, then you reassure the patient and discharge. But then if it looks malignant, then you have to calculate the risk of malignancy, whether he has a low risk, intermediate risk, or a high risk. And this is calculated using the, using the predictor models. So that's what, that is where the predictor models come into picture, that you use the predictor models to calculate low, intermediate, or high risk. Because depending on whether it's a low risk, intermediate risk, or a high risk, your next step will change. What you do next will change. And that will come in the guidelines when I talk about it. Remember, this is quite important that you have to actually use the predictor models to go into low, intermediate, or high risk. And we'll repeatedly talk about these risk models. Okay. So, what are the CT scan requirements? BT scan, BTS scan, uh, BTS uh, guidelines very clearly states this beautifully. It says that the scan, the first scan, should be at least 1.25 millimeters thickness. Okay. The first scan is not low dose CT. The follow up scan is a low dose CT. Okay, so remember this the first scan is usually an HRCT. You don't do a contrast CT straight away. If you see a simple SPN in a chest x ray, you send the patient for HRCT. We will ask you this in the exam. The follow up, depending on whether you decide to follow up or not, the follow up will be a low dose CT with 1.25 millimeter thickness. So very thin scans. And particularly, the CT has to concentrate on the area of the nodule. So the scan, the sections that you do, particularly you have to concentrate on where was the nodule seen in the previous scan. Once you've done that, you have to use the software to highlight maximum intensity projection okay this is a radiological tool which helps you to highlight the nodule and then you have to do if you have the software what is called as volume rendering so nowadays you know those in in the good old days we used to put a line across and measure the transverse diameter that is not so sensitive for an spn because you may or may not take the images in the same things. You might not be comparing uh, the same type of CT in the follow-up as what you did in the first uh, phase. So it, instead of using a diameter measurement, if you have the software and if you're in a good center, then the correct method for diagnosing growth of a nodule 
or increase in size of the nodule is to use volume rendering. So you do MIP and then you use the formula to calculate the volume of the, of the, of the mass. And the volume of the mass tells you whether the SPN has changed its size or not. Okay, very important to understand this. So the diameter may be wrong. You may not get the correct diameter. But if you don't have volume rendering software, then of course you use diameter. And then you try to measure. But you know, in an 8 mm nodule, in a 6 mm nodule, a like for like, it's very difficult to compare the diameter. So that's why they say you, you preferably should use the volume rendering rather than uh, diameter. And, and particularly the BTS guideline says any increase in diameter of uh, uh, any increase in size of more than two millimeters, which could be by volume rendering or by diameter, that increase is significant. You must worry about something that has changed size from uh, A to B, two millimeters larger. That is suggestive that there could be some malignant change going on. So a two millimeter uh, difference to pick up on purely diameter reading is very difficult. Whereas volume rendering is a very sensitive tool which will tell you accurately up to the millimeter. And when you report on that, you have to report on the nodule shape, you have to report on the nodule position, and more importantly, you have to talk about the interval between the scans. Because some, if a volume change of two millimeters has happened, between uh, uh, two scans done three months apart as compared to two scans done one year apart has a different connotation because obviously the risk of malignancy is increasing when the interval between the scan is, uh, is shorter. So this is a usual one that uh, the ACGP has spoken about. And this is how, this gives you an idea of how uh, it might be a benign nodule or it might be a malignant nodule. So these are just guidelines should tell you that, you know, a border is smooth, the border is irregular, speculated. Uh, usually it's a dense, solid, benign, a non-solid or ground glass, more likely to be malignant. Uh, you have to look for these features I told you about, the popcorn-like uh, or central or concentric. And usually uh, malignants will be non-calcified uh, or eccentric uh, calcification and the duration, the doubling time is what you also measure. So this volume rendering gives you an indirect calculation of the doubling time of the tumor. And it's very important to understand uh, the doubling time and that will actually give you an idea. If it's less than one month doubling time, it is not going to be cancer. It is going to be infection because infection increases and then decreases. Whereas uh, malignancy gradually increases over a period of time. So if it's a very quick uh, doubling time, then it is more likely to be infection, not likely to be malignancy. Uh, so things like that actually help you to identify what is a benign lesion and what is a malignant lesion. Okay. So far, so good. Everybody with me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is it making yes, sense? Sir. Okay, yes. good. Yes, sir. Yes. All right, yes, sir. good. So let's just continue with the radiology. So we look at size, we look at shape, we look at margins, we look at radio density, we look at the CT density or the CT volume. Uh, contrast enhancement is another feature which will actually give you a clue as to whether you're dealing with malignant or with benign. And rim enhancement is another clue and presence or absence of calcification. So I'll go through this again. This is a question you might be asked in the exam. How do you know that this nodule is, is malignant or benign? What are the features on a CT? So you've got to talk about the size. You've got to talk about the shape. You've got to talk about the margins. You've got to talk about the radio density. Talk about the CT density. Talk about contrast, contrast enhancement talk about rim enhancement, and talk about calcification. Okay, these are the factors which define what is a benign nodule and what is a malignant nodule. So this is a margin. Now this, even if you're sleeping, you will tell me that this is an irregular margin, speculated, very high chance that this is a malignant uh, lesion. It's called as corona radiata. Okay, this thing going out like a sunshine, okay, sun rays. 
uh, cystic leucency with rim enhancement. Okay, particularly when you get rim enhancement, uh, you may be actually dealing with infections or you may be dealing with uh, with a benign lesion. But unfortunately, sometimes adenocarcinomas also show the same feature. They show a rim enhancement, but no enhancement within the center of the tumor. And this is a very difficult situation. And so whenever you get a cystic leucency with a rim enhancement, don't just think benign because about 16 to 20 percent of adenocarcinomas actually present with this feature and if you just don't biopsy this you will lose the diagnosis and you'll end up with a different thing now air bronchogram is very important air bronchogram gives you a clue that something is happening with this, this nodule this is not normal so this is part solid part uh, uh, part uh, non-solid and an air bronchogram. This will actually increase my uh, uh, my warning sign that I have to be sure that this is not a malignant. I will not leave this, say this is benign and go away. Uh, whenever you see an air bronchogram, be careful. You might be actually dealing with a malignant change in a small nodule. Uh, the shapes are important. As I told you, a rounded circular. Usually a benign lesion is multifaceted and multi-sided. It's called as polygonal, okay? And you have to do a 3D ratio. 3D ratio means vertical diameter, maximum transverse diameter, divided by maximum vertical diameter. If the 3D ratio is more than 1.78, then usually this mass is going to be benign, which means that uh, the transverse diameter is more than the maximum vertical diameter. In, in a malignant thing, both the diameters will, will increase. So this ratio will go down, okay? So it's quite important to understand you can use this technique. It's a CT technique for identifying uh, or defining what is a, uh, what is a uh, malignant or what is a benign thing. And this is there from the CD, BTS guidelines, okay? It's mentioned, uh, sorry, not in BTS guidelines. This is there from the radiology guidelines and they have mentioned that uh, use of this gives you an idea whether you're dealing with a benign condition or whether you're dealing with a malignant condition a contrast enhancement is quite important the way you do contrast enhancement is usually you do four scans at one minute interval anytime the contrast enhancement is low then you're really likely to be dealing with a benign condition the moment the contrast enhancement is higher then there is high chance that the metabolism in this nodule is high and the uh, vascularization in this nodule is high. So the chances are you're dealing with a malignant condition. So high contrast enhancement, malignant condition, less contrast enhancement, benign condition. The one thing in between these two is AVMs. AVMs will give you high contrast enhancements, but then there are other pathology, other clinical features which will tell you that this is an AVM. So be careful about that, uh, but look at contrast enhancements. Uh, solidity of the nodule, we spoke about, that's a solid nodule, that's a part solid nodule, and that's a uh, solid nodule with a GGO component. So this is a mixed nodule. Okay, solid nodule, but there is also a GGO surrounding it. And then this is a GGO, a complete GGO, okay? So when we talk in terms of management of the nodule, these are the factors which we will be talking about. A solid nodule, a part solid nodule, or a GGO. Okay, so you must know what we are talking. This picture is important. Keep this picture in your mind when I come to the part about management of GGOs or management of a solid or a part solid nodule. Uh, so GGOs can, uh, this thing, uh, it can arise from, uh, it's a hazy focal density with ill-defined uh, margins. You've got to think about inflammatory things as well in GGOs. Don't forget that very often inflammatory uh, lesions will cause GGOs, but, but uh, solid lesions usually arise from the airway and um, adenocarcinomas can present as GGO. So adenocarcinomas can present with a bubble-like cystic leucency with a bronchogram. Remember the bronchogram that I showed you on the CT? That's quite important. And if it's a cystic leucency, the one which I showed you with the rim enhancement, that could be an adenocarcinoma. Uh, if it is part solid, think about mixed mucinous or non-mucinous adenocarcinomas. So it's very important to keep this in your mind. And in a non-solid or in a pure GGO, 
uh, it could be adenocarcinoma in situ or atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. There is a lot of talk of GGOs. The Japanese and the Koreans are really investigating the GGOs in great depth. And in fact, histopathology has changed. They have now come up with new classification of an adenocarcinoma purely on the basis of GGOs. And you must know this histopathology if you get a patient with GGO, that there are different types of GGOs uh, which are associated with different histopathology. So adenocarcinomas are atypical adenomatous hyperplasia, AIS, a minimally invasive adenocarcinoma or invasive adenocarcinoma. So this classification purely came out of the Japanese and the Korean work on quantifying the amount of uh, GGO that is taking place. So if you look here, it tells you what is the range of uh, the GGO, what is the CT findings. So less than five millimeters, five to 30 millimeters, uh, part solid nodule, PSN is a part solid nodule. So there will be some solid areas and there will be some GGO areas. And if it's a predominantly solid nodule, then you're talking about invasive adenocarcinoma. So it goes the other way. So ground glass less than five, AAH. A ground glass five to 30 millimeters, AIS. A part solid nodule, but less than five millimeters, MIA. And invasive carcinoma will usually be either a larger part solid, more than five millimeters, or will be a solid nodule. Okay, did this make sense? This slide, it's quite important to understand this. Okay, yes, sir. So, did this make sense? This slide, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, the histopathology yes, is important of adenocarcinoma. In all of this, the problematic uh, tumor is adenocarcinoma because unfortunately, adenocarcinoma can be PET negative, and uh, you know, 20% of adenocarcinomas can be PET negative, and then you're you just follow it up and the next thing you know, there's mediastinal lymph nodes and it becomes inoperable. So it's very, very, very important to understand these, this differential diagnosis of adenocarcinomas, particularly in relation to uh, the type of nodule that is present. So ground glass less than five millimeters, AAH, ground glass five millimeters to 30 millimeters, AIS, part solid nodule with a solid area of less than five millimeters, MIA, so when you discuss the CT and when you tell that this is a, uh, this is a part solid uh, nodule which has got about, which is about one centimeter in diameter, half of it looks as if it is solid area. I'll, tell, I'll ask you the question, what do you think it is if it is a cancer? Then you have to say it's more likely to be minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. You understand? That's how the question comes to you. And this, this, this is all when you are really doing well and you're getting into the, uh, the, the good and the very good and the excellent scale of the discussion, then I will ask you these questions. Uh, of course, if you're struggling to even pick up a solid uh, a GGO or you're struggling to pick up a solitary pulmonary nodule, then of course I won't go to this discussion. Okay, so, so far, so we have spoken about chest X-ray, we have spoken about uh, CT scans. Now let's speak about PET scans. Does it have any role in a solitary pulmonary nodule? Uh, it's not recommended for lesions less than one centimeter, but usually what we do is whenever we have something where we are suspecting malignancy, we do the PET scan to see for disseminated areas. So rather than looking for the lesion itself, if you are asked in an exam, would you do a PET scan in a solitary pulmonary? You must say yes. The answer always safest is to say yes. Because you're not looking at the lesion in the lung, but what you're looking for is disseminated disease. So one SPN in the lung doesn't mean that you might have a big tumor, uh, you might not have a big tumor in the uh, adrenals, or you might pick up a, a primary uh, colonic cancer in the bowel. So that is why it is very important to do a PET scan in SPN, okay? So even though we're talking about small diameters, still SPN gives you a uh, very good indication of peripheral disease or metastasis. Squamous cell carcinoma particularly has a high expression of glucose transporter. And so usually uh, squamous cell carcinomas present as red hot or very high uptake uh, in PET scans. This is the problem. This guy causes most of the problems for people. It is the adenocarcinoma, which is PET negative. Because just on the basis of PET, if you see no activity, you cannot call it a benign lesion. It still could be an adenocarcinoma, 
which is actually false negative, okay? Uh, if you do a PET positive lesion and you do a biopsy, there are no false positive, which means you cannot get malignancy on your PET scan and then say, no, no, this was a mistake. There are no false positives on PET. If it's a malignancy, it's a malignancy uh, if you have confirmed it on biopsy. But the reverse is problem. The reverse problem is a negative PET or a negative biopsy on a positive PET does not exclude disease. You know, it could be that your needle didn't hit the representative area. So this is the understanding of PET that you must have. That if you do a PET and you do a biopsy, if the result is positive, great. The problem is when the result is negative, you cannot sit on it. You cannot say that this is not a cancer. You have to actually do more tests to find out whether this is a cancer, okay? So it does not exclude disease. That is the most important thing that you have to understand, okay? All right. Uh, what do you mean when you say PET scans, how do you classify? What does it mean by saying uh, low uptake, high uptake, moderate uptake, okay? When we do that, if it's absent, okay, if PET scan calls it as absent uptake, that means that the lesion is the same as the background, okay? That is an absent uptake. If you're talking about a faint uptake, then you have to compare the lesion to the mediastinal blood pool. You look at the mediastinum, and if the uptake is slightly more than the mediastinal blood pool, then it's a faint uptake. Okay, it's slightly less than the mediastinal blood pool, then it's a faint uptake. If it is more than the mediastinal blood pool, then it is usually called as a moderate uptake. And if it's markedly greater than the mediastinal blood pool, then it is called as intense uptake. And this is from the BTS guidelines, okay, from one of the papers in the BTS guidelines. So they have actually qualified each one of them as to what is the pathology on the pet and how do you talk when you talk about a pet. And this is the differentiation. So really the comparison is with mediastinal blood pool rather than uh, this thing. So when, you, when you're looking here uh, and you're looking for an SPM, you have to compare it with the mediastinal blood pool. This, this blood pool is the one that you're comparing it. So this is high uptake because this is markedly greater than the mediastinal blood pool. Can you see that? And so this is a high uptake. Uh, so if you look at this, this is less or almost equal to the mediastinal. So this is less than this, okay? But it is still there. You can see some faint activity. So it is a faint uptake. Can you understand that? So you have to compare this with this. So less than is usually faint uptake. More than is moderate. Intense is intense, okay? All right. Now this is a false negative pet, okay? This is a, pair, this is a solitary pulmonary nodule. But really, there is no uptake or very low uptake in the, in the nodule when you compare it with the mediastinal thing. And you think, shit, this is not a cancer. You cannot actually, on the basis of a PET, call this not a cancer. You cannot have that audacity to do that because we said that false negative PETs happens in adenocarcinoma, almost up to 20%. Different studies talk about different uh, numbers. Some textbooks say 16%, some textbooks say 20 uh, some papers say 13%. So we usually just give a range. So almost uh, 13 to 20% adenocarcinomas may actually be a false negative on PET. And I'm repeating this again and again because this is very, very important factor in clinical practice. You cannot call a false negative PET as no cancer, okay? So is this clear about PET? Did you understand the PET concepts? Yes. Okay. So the next we come to are what are the blood tests that you need to do? Okay, so are there any blood tests which will give you an indication of what's happening in a solitary pulmonary nodule? So there are many tests which correlate with diseases. So you've got to look at the whole picture. Don't just look at the chest X-ray and the CT scan. Look at the whole picture. So if there's any anemia monocytosis, you could be dealing with tuberculosis. If there's race ESR, race CRP, you could be dealing with inflammatory disease. Uh, raised ANCA antibodies, you could be having uh, granulomatous or polyangitis uh, pathology in the background. So a nodule in the lung may be granulomatous. 
Don't forget about hypokalemic alkalosis, ectopic ACTH. You could be dealing with lung carcinoids. So looking at the blood test can give you an estimation as to whether you're dealing with a different disease or not. Hypercalcemia raised ALP, metastatic bone disease. Okay. Uh, increased LDH uh, could be primary pulmonary lymphoma. Uh, serum precipitants of aspergillus could be aspergilloma. Um, high IgG, IgM antibodies could be histoplasmosis, coccidiodomycosis, or fungal infection. Uh, look for ACE could suggest sarcoidosis. I'm not saying do all these tests in all the patients, but depending on what is the history and you have done the blood test, this is how you interpret the lung nodule on the basis of these uh, blood tests. So if you've got tumor markers increased like PSA, CEA, beta HCG, then think about these uh, tumors and think that this could be a metastasis from there. But the important thing to remember is that the guidelines do not recommend blood tests. The BTS guidelines says blood markers are not very sensitive. Hence, they are not used for evaluation. But in clinical practice, you will always do these blood tests if there is an associated history. But blood tests are not part of the guidelines. So you don't have to do a blood test to actually identify whether uh, what is the next step of management for this patient. Okay? So you must know these markers, but they are not part of the guideline. Hence, they are not used for evaluation because they are not sensitive. The problem is they are not adequately sensitive to tell you that A is equal to B. Okay? Uh, again, the guideline is D. So you got to remember that. Okay, so that's so much about the blood test in a solitary pulmonary nodule. So what about what are the tissue diagnostic tools that are avail that are available to you, which will tell you that uh, you know you this is a solitary pulmonary nodule of malignant origin. That's what you're trying to establish. Putin cytology, not a great tool at all at the moment. Uh, very little studies done on it. Uh, there is a lot of work going on on breath analysis, breath analysis for lung cancer. But at this moment, the evidence is pretty weak on it and we, we cannot use it as, as a tool for diagnosing uh, lung cancer. Uh, bronchoscopic biopsy, yes, you can use it, particularly if it's a, if it's a central uh, solitary pulmonary nodule and you think you can get, get to it. Or if you have access to advanced techniques uh, like EBUS or EUS, uh, they will allow you to get to the to the nodule and take a biopsy. Uh, I forgot to mention EMN. EMN is also a very good tool, uh, particularly for solitary pulmonary nodules. Of course, you can use radiology guided uh, biopsies. If it's a small peripheral tumor, then you can do either an ultrasound guided, a CT guided, or a fluoroscopy guided biopsy, depending upon whatever is the experience available at your center. The best one is, of course, CT guided biopsy. For all of us, that's what we do. If, if you do not have access to any of this, or if any of this is inconclusive, then you still have the option of surgical biopsy. And the surgical biopsy can be done by VATS or open. But currently, uh, all recommendations say you should do it by VATS. Okay? So open now is out of the windows. Most of the recommendations are saying that whenever you're evaluating a solitary pulmonary nodule, the surgery access should be by VATS. Okay? So this is there in the guidelines, no two ways about it. And once you're in there, you can either do a punch biopsy if you see the thing on the periphery, or if it's very deep and you're worried uh, uh, that you, you don't want to take away a large part of lung just to diagnose uh, an inflammatory condition. So you could do a true cut biopsy on the table. I, I have done this many times when it's a very deep tumor and I want to send a frozen section or something like that. Uh, by, by VATS and on the table, I will do uh, put in a needle and do a true cut biopsy. Uh, and of course, you've got the option of doing a wedge biopsy. A wedge biopsy will obviously give you more tissue and will help you understand what is happening. So what are the... Manjuna, just switch off your phone, please. Uh, what are the uh, risks? Uh, what are the pros and cons of a CT guided biopsy? You have the risk of pneumothorax, bleeding, hemoptysis. We all know that. That's not a big thing. But the important thing is the diagnostic accuracy is pretty good, but it is completely operator dependent. It completely depends on how good a radiologist you have. So if you have a good radiologist, he can get you a diagnostic accuracy of 96%. Uh, the sensitivity is 95% and the specificity is 100%. So negative biopsy does not exclude a malignancy. This is the important thing. 
if a positive biopsy comes through it will be a malignancy but a negative biopsy does not exclude malignancy you have to remember this all the time if you have an spm and the risk evaluation of malignancy is high and you did a ct guided biopsy and the biopsy came back uh, negative you still have to do the next step you have to go and surgically take it out because the risk of malignancy is high and the chances are it would be malignant so negative biopsy does not exclude malignancy very 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 important hence you have to keep surgical biopsy as a backup tool all the time whenever you are doing evaluation of an spm what about genomics is there any role for genomics for uh, assessing single or multiple nodules you can look for egfr mutations which may give you an indication of what's happening in the cancer uh, you can do a new technique called as next generation sequencing uh, but at this moment of time uh, they are there is not enough evidence to support the use of genomics as a routine tool for um, either evaluating classifying or following up a patient with a solitary pulmonary nodule so no guideline talks about genomics as a tool for uh, for uh, spn but uh, if you've got the facility in house you can use it for further treatment so if you've got a diagnosis of lung cancer and you've done the surgery you can take that thing and send it out for uh, genomics or uh, egfr or next generation sequencing but they are not a good tool for pre operative follow up or pre operative uh, assessment of a solitary pulmonary nodule a uh, liquid biopsy is another tool that they are looking at at the moment uh, but there is no clear evidence as yet in lung cancer we still don't have that marker in the blood which will tell you that uh, you know the lung cancer is high or not high hence you need tissue biopsy liquid biopsy really is not a good tool and doesn't give you the idea whether you are dealing with malignancy or not so that's why tissue biopsy is the way not liquid biopsy okay all right so far so good everybody understood the pathway that i'm following i started yes, off sir. with with defining what is an spn i tried to define what are the various types of spn which means uh, solid part solid ggo then we've defined each one of them what it means then we went through the clinical features of an spn to identify uh, what is on the history that will give you a clue as to the diagnosis of the spn we looked at clinical features on examination uh we then looked at the investigations which included a chest x ray and a ct scan uh we looked at what are the modalities of follow up on a ct scan we said that the first ct scan should be hrct and then it should be followed up if you have to follow up with a low dose ct this uh, it should be a thin slice low dose ct particularly through the area of the nodule uh we spoke about the role of pet scan in spn we also then spoke about the role of blood tests in spn what is the various markers of individual metastases uh, or inflammatory diseases and then we tried to evaluate genomics and we tried to evaluate liquid biopsy so that is where we are at now this from here this point onwards we actually start talking in real clinical terms what is the treat uh, how to follow the pathway and the one that i am going to follow today is accp guidelines okay and then i'll tell you highlights from other guidelines how they correlate with the accp guidelines so let's put this as the first phase and then start talking about it okay so accp has published two papers on this uh, one was the uh, published in chess 2013 where they actually uh, spoke about the guidelines and then there was a supplement uh, in um, in in uh, subsequent years where they spoke about the highlights just the important points or practice clinical guidelines for the accp guideline so there are two separate papers out there which you have to look up and they will help you so i'm quickly going to go through the three pathways that have been mentioned on an accp so whenever you get a solid pulmonary nodule the first question you ask yourself is is this more than 8 mm or less than 8 mm okay so if it is more than 8 mm then you follow up with ct and i'll talk about that in a minute just leave 8 to 30 mm leave it to one side uh, my next pathway will show you what to do in that 
If it is less than eight millimeters, then you have to do an assessment for lung cancer probability. The tests I told you about, the VA and the uh, Brox test, these are odds ratio of lung cancer. Then you've got to decide whether the probability is very low, intermediate or high. Okay, and that is 5%, 5 to 60 or more than 60. And then depending upon the probability of lung cancer, then you decide what is the next step in the management of this patient. What is the radiology that you need to do and what is the treatment? At this moment, I'm not going into each one of this. We'll talk about it in a minute. Now, anything that's between eight and 30 millimeters, there's a different pathway if the surgical risk is low or the surgical risk is high. So leave the red ones away. Don't look at the red ones. Just look at the blue ones. So if the surgical risk is low in an eight millimeter to 30 millimeter pathway, then again, you do your uh, models, the probability models of cancer, and then you decide A, B, or C. Very low, low, or high. And then depending upon whether it's very low, then you go into CT surveillance. If it is low to moderate, you go into PET scan surveillance. You do a PET scan in low and moderate. And then if the PET is negative, then you can go into the CT surveillance. If the PET is positive, you can do a non-surgical biopsy. Again, if, if there's mild uptake, you can do a non-surgical biopsy. And if you don't want to do a non-surgical biopsy or if you don't have access to a non-surgical biopsy, you can step directly into the surgical biopsy regime, okay? This is quite clear. Now, the problem is in, in this arm, okay? In this arm, the problem is that in a high probability of lung cancer, the ACCP, uh, unfortunately, this was in 2013, it actually said you should do stage evaluation, but it said plus or minus PET. Actually, that is not true. Now, almost everybody uses a PET. There is no situation where in a lung cancer, you would not use a PET, particularly in a high thing. So very often, if you really read the guidelines, you will say, it says if you have a high probability of a, of a PET CT, don't do functional evaluation, directly go to surgery. Okay, and this is actually not the right pathway. This is, has changed with time now. So instead of plus or minus PET, it says you must do a PET. Okay, you'll, you'll find this when we go through the guidelines. And once you've done the PET, if there are no metastases, you're still in SPN mode. And if you're in SPN mode, you do a surgical biopsy. Did you understand this? This is one pathway. And again, I'll keep repeating this. It will come in the guidelines as well. This is just the first chart to show you a feel of what we are talking about. Then you come to the other side. Again, the risk is high for surgery. These are people with very poor uh, lung function test or other comorbidities. Then you could actually go into CT surveillance because these guys will not withstand surgery or a biopsy. Or if they do withstand any of these, then do a non-surgical biopsy. And then if it's malignant, then of course you've got to go into the route of uh, evaluating the malignancy. And then if they are not fit for surgery, you can think of SBRT or RFA. Uh, if it is non-diagnostic, you put him into CT surveillance. If it's a specific benign disease, you just disturb the guy. Okay? So this is a broad feel of the pathway. Just have a look again at this. Take a snapshot of the screen. And now we will talk about each one in more detail. Okay? There's one more table to follow. So this was 8 to 30 mm. The next table to follow is talking about less than 8 mm, okay? So what do you do in less than 8 mm? ACCP divides the less than 8 mm into three. Less than four, four to six, six to eight. Are you with me? So less than 8 mm is less than four, four to six, six to eight. Again, you have to calculate. The risk stratification has to be done. Okay, does the patient have high risk, have risk factors for lung cancer? If it is no, it goes down into this pathway. If it is yes, it goes, on, goes down into this pathway. If it is no, then a less than four millimeters, you don't have to do this. A follow-up is optional. You discuss with the patient and you can even discharge the patient. If it is four to six millimeters with a low risk of lung cancer, then you do one CT scan at 12 months and if there is no change in the nodule, you just send him for follow, uh, no additional follow-ups, okay? Is this clear? And the third one is if it is six to eight millimeters and the risk of lung cancer is low, then you do one CT at six to 12 months, you do one follow-up CT at 18 to 24 months, 
And if there is no change in the size, you discharge the patient. So this is one pathway that you've got. And this will come in the guidelines again. We'll discuss this again when the guidelines come up. You looked at the other side of the eight millimeters. You characterize according to nodule size, less than four, but there is a high risk of lung cancer according to the prediction models. You do not send this guy away. As here you are sending him away or you're discussing with the patient and saying, should you have a CT or no? That's optional. Here it is not optional. Here it is definitive. You must do at least one CT scan at 12 months. And if the CT scan at 12 months is stable, no need for additional follow-up. Is this clear? So this has moved this way, okay? Just one step to the right. If it is four to six millimeters, you must do follow-up imaging six to 12 months if stable and one at 18 to 24 months. So what was here for six to eight has actually now become four to six. So it is just one step to the right. And the other one that you can see here is if it is six to eight millimeters, but high risk of cancer, then you do one CT at three to six months, repeat the CT at nine to 12 months, and then repeat the CT at 24 months. Is this pathway clear? Yes, sir. Yes or no? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, it's important yes, to understand this. So I'm going to just go back one slide and again quantify everything. Sorry, let's go back once. So two, two pathways, two separate pathways. One is for eight to 30 millimeters and the other pathway is for less than eight millimeters. Eight to 30 millimeters, low to moderate risk of surgery. You go down this again, everything that you do, you have to do a uh, probability testing. You've got to tell how, what is the risk of cancer and very low CT surveillance, low to moderate, you go down, do a PET scan. If a PET scan is negative, you can either do a CT surveillance or you can do a CT guided biopsy if there's mild uptake. If it is moderate or intense uptake, you do a non-surgical biopsy, depending upon the patient's choice, or you can do a surgical biopsy, okay? And then if surgical biopsy is present, uh, on table, you can actually do a frozen section and follow it up with surgery. Again, if the risk of surgery is high, you do an evaluation, you do a PET scan. If there is no metastasis, then you go in for local biopsy of that lesion, okay? This is the one for non-surgical management because this guy is high risk for surgery. So you have an option of SBRT or RFA or chemo radiotherapy, depending on whatever is the diagnosis of this patient, whether there is no metastasis or there is N2, N3 metastasis. And here, it's all CT surveillance, okay? And here, if it's an unfit guy, it is still a CT surveillance because the patient cannot withstand a needle biopsy or cannot withstand a surgical intervention. And eight millimeter, this is the key one. This is the one you have to understand. You have to do the risk, uh, risk factor stratification, which I told you the Brox method, the Mayo Brox or the VA method. And then you go down this route, less than four, no follow-up, four to six, one 12 month CT scan, each table, no follow-up. 6 to 8, 6 to 12 month, 1 CT, follow-up CT at 18 to 24 months. And if it is stable, no follow-up. If there is a high risk for cancer, then characterize it according to size, 4 millimeters, do 1 CT at 12 months. If stable, no need for additional follow-up. Characterize nodule according to size, 4 to 6 millimeters, follow-up imaging in 6 months or 18 months. And if both of, uh, not or, and 18 months, so six to 12 months and 18 to 24 months, if all of this is stable, then no follow-up. If there's a high risk of cancer and the size is six to eight millimeters, the CT scan is done at three to six months. If it is stable, then you continue at nine to 12 months and 24 months. If during this period at any point, the situation changes and the growth of the tumor is more than two millimeters or the shape of the tumor has changed, then you go into the next mode that is a non-surgical biopsy. So you upgrade depending on what is the status of the nodule. All of this is if the nodule is stable. And if the nodule becomes unstable at any point during all of this follow-up, then very quickly you upgrade to the next stage of evaluation, which is either a 
uh, needle biopsy or a surgical biopsy. So this is the understanding of the guideline. Now let's look through each of the guideline and look at the grade of recommendation. Okay, everybody clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, clear? Is it yes, sir. Sense what we are saying? Okay, good. So now let's look at the guideline. This is the ACCP guideline. What does it say? So it says that if you've got anybody with a uh, visible nodule on a chest X-ray or CT scan, please review prior imaging. Very high level of recommendation. Okay, level of evidence one. So please review prior imaging in a patient. Do not. Uh, think that uh, you know it's okay this is a new nodule because it will very very often you'll find that there was a change from a previous uh, x-ray or there was no nodule on a previous x-ray so very important to review prior imaging that's the first guideline the second guideline it says is if a nodule has been stable for more than two years there is no additional diagnostic imaging required okay so in all of the pathway that i showed you earlier Two years is what we look at and if at two years everything is okay you are quite safe to say that this is not lung cancer and you do not need to do any additional diagnostic imaging uh, grade of recommendation 2c if it's an indeterminate nodule on chest x-ray then you need a ct scan with thin sections through the nodule okay is it making sense now after all the explanation is this uh, guideline making sense so you need to do a ct scan with thin sections through the nodule level of evidence 1c solitary pulmonary nodule this is the management pathway we said less than 8 8 to 15 and more than 15 directly you go into a pet ct biopsy okay uh, this is a summary for less than 4 4 to 8 and more than 8 so let's look at the next guide like uh, this is pure, pure GGO. I'll stop this. I'll do it a bit later. Sorry, that slide came a bit late. So what if the nodule is more than eight? Okay, if the nodule is, if it's a solid nodule and it is more than eight, you have to use the validated models that I told you. Estimate the pretest probability of malignancy. The level of evidence is 2C. You can do it either by qualitative method, by clinical judgment, or even better is by using quantitative models for the validated models. Uh, the Brox model, the uh, Mayo Brox model, or the VA model, okay? All right, so that's very highly recommended in the guide, guidelines. If it's a solid nodule, somebody switch off your microphone. If it's a solid nodule more than eight millimeters, but the probability of cancer was low, which was, Five to sixty percent, which is uh, the low and the uh, intermediate. Then you need to do a PET scan. Okay, so in low and intermediate things, you must do a PET scan. Now this is the one where I have a problem with. It says high pretest probability of malignancy, no need for functional imaging. This is actually not right. This has changed now. I think the next edition will change because here they are saying just go for surgery directly. But most of the newer uh, papers that are coming up are saying that you must do a PET scan, make sure there is no metastasis. And if there is no metastasis, then you go for either surgical biopsy or non-surgical biopsy, depending upon the fitness of the patient. So this one, 4.2.4.2, this is the one which will change, I think, in the next uh, set of guidelines. Okay, solid nodule, more than eight millimeters, Discuss all management strategies with the patient and always go with what is the patient's preference. You cannot force the patient to have a surgical biopsy. If the patient wants to have a non-surgical biopsy, please follow that pathway. So that is why we are speaking about the risk and benefits of all the management uh, strategies and elicit patient's preference. This is again level of evidence 1C, okay? Uh, what do you do when there's a solid nodule more than eight millimeters? Is there a serial CT scan follow-up? Uh, when clinical probability of cancer is very low, which is less than 5%, then, uh, and, and the patient is PET negative, uh, needle biopsy is non-diagnostic, PET is non-hypermetabolic, 
or when clinically informed patient prefers to have CT follow-up. So in these situations, you do a serial CT follow-up, okay? So a solid nodule more than eight millimeters, when do you do a serial CT follow-up? This is the question we ask you. That if here is your CT scan, this is an eight, uh, this is a 10 centimeter, 10 millimeter nodule. Uh, where, will you follow this up with a serial CT or will you actually do operate on this patient? So this is what you have to say. You have to say, according to the guidelines, if the clinical probability of cancer is very low, you're okay to do a serial CT follow-up. If there is a low clinical probability and you've done a PET which came back negative, you're okay. But still, you've got to keep adenocarcinoma in mind. If the needle biopsy, which is a non-surgical intervention, is non-diagnostic and the PET was non-hypermetabolic, you can do a serial CT. Or if the patient wishes to do a serial CT. This is the answer to that question. This question is asked in the exam pretty often uh, just to confuse you. And most of the people will say, no, 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 no need to do serial CT. You must operate on this patient. A lot of people answer that when I ask them, here is a uh, 12 mm nodule. What are you going to do? So most of the people will say, I'll operate on this patient. That is not true, actually. You've actually got to go through the pathway. And the pathway is clearly defined as to what you should do. Okay? All right. Uh, see, the surveillance is 3 to 6 months, 9 to 12 months, 18 to 24 months. Here we are talking about probability of cancer being high. Okay? So this is what you have to do. And the CT has to be thin sliced, non-contrast, low dose CT. You have to calculate the area, the volume, and the mass of the volume. This is from the guidelines. Okay? All right. If there is clear evidence of malignant growth, that means it increased in size or there was a change, then you cannot sit on it. You cannot say serial CT follow-up. That's not allowed. If there's a clear evidence of malignant growth, you must go for non-surgical biopsy, which could be a CT-guided, EBUS, FNAC, whatever. Uh, or you could do a surgical biopsy. You might actually do away with a non-surgical biopsy and directly go for a surgical biopsy. Both are allowed. It's not a problem. It's, it's okay if either one of them you follow. Uh, if solid nodule decreases in size, then you go back to the serial CT. And for two years, two years is what it is. So if it increases in size, you must biopsy. If the nodule decreases in size, don't just say that this is not cancer, but still follow up the patient for two years to make sure that the resolution is actually happening and it is not an error of reading of the CT. That's why they say you must make sure that you follow these guys up for two years because sometimes a two millimeter decrease in size may not be uh, adequately represented on the CT. And if you don't follow it up, the next CT may change it into six centimeters. So you've got to be careful about that. So they have said that clearly in the guidelines that even if the solid nodule with a high risk of cancer decreases in size, you should not give up on the patient. You should follow up the patient for two years for resolution or non-growth to confirm that there is non-growth, okay? Uh, what are the non-surgical diagnoses? They talk about that. Uh, they say when clinical probability of cancer uh, is there and imaging findings are discordant, that means you're not agreeing with what is seen on the PET, but you still think there is a probability of cancer, then go ahead and do a needle biopsy. Okay? Uh, like a PET negative. So there is high risk of cancer, but the PET was negative. So should you just give up on this guy? Should you just follow up with CT? No, actually, go ahead and do a CT-guided biopsy. If the clinical probability 10 to 60%, low to moderate, uh, if it's a benign disease requiring specific medical treatment, okay, like uh, TB or something else, then you can biopsy these or sarcoidosis, you can biopsy these and send them onwards for specific medical treatment. If a fully informed patient wants a biopsy, you must then do a CT guided biopsy, okay? So it clearly talks about when you should do a CT guided biopsy. So if a patient wants a biopsy, you must do it, okay? It's very important, especially when the patient is a high risk for surgery. So if it's a fully informed patient, high risk for surgery, don't just jump to surgery. Do a CT guided biopsy in between and that will help you to understand what is happening. What about the surgical diagnosis? What are they saying? What are the guidelines talking about the surgery itself? The guideline says that when clinical probability of cancer is high, uh, you must do a surgical diagnosis. Uh, in between, you can do a PET scan, uh, but uh, a needle biopsy is not the way. You really need to get in there and take it out, okay? So if it's intensely hypermetabolic, 
non surgical biopsy suggests malignancy so you have done a ct guided biopsy not really sure one or two cells showing some malignant change or a patient says i want a surgical biopsy so this this is the answer to that question when do you do a surgical biopsy in a solitary pulmonary nodule that is the question asked to you in an exam whenever we ask you a question we are actually asking you a question directly from guidelines and so we want an answer directly from guidelines we don't want you to just uh, bully around you know that, that's not so good so when i ask you when will you operate on a patient with a solitary pulmonary nodule more than 8 mm you have to say this when the clinical probability of cancer is high when the pen is intensely hypermetabolic when no, when a ct guided biopsy suggests some malignant cells or if the patient wishes to have surgery so it has addressed all the issues very very clearly as a guideline uh, the accp talks about vats it says that the surgery should be by vats okay it is very very important that it should not be an open surgery nowadays nobody should do open surgery for a solitary pulmonary nodule the guideline it says one c level of recommendation that this should be by vats okay and if uh, you find that it's a very tiny nodule then you can use the advanced localization tools uh, you can do this by either using a, a ct guided uh, coil wire or using a dye injection uh, technique or by uh, this thing this is a different talk altogether i do a talk on this where i talk about uh, localization techniques for small cancers and nowadays we can, you can use an rfid chip so you go bronchoscopically and place an rfid chip into the lesion and then go in by vats and use an RF, rfid probe and that will beep and that will tell you exactly where that uh, nodule is so it's not an easy surgery by vats you really need to be experienced to palpate the lung by vats and if sometimes you might even need to use uh, certain techniques to actually highlight the area to wedge out so otherwise you'll miss the miss the lesion so it's important to understand that now what about an spn less than 8 mm with no risk for surgery uh, less than 4 mm we said that no need for follow up but patient's consent is needed if the patient is worried then you can do one ct at 12 months and that's it okay uh, 4 to 6 mm we said that 12 months uh, low dose non contrast ct uh, 4 to 6 mm no change no further follow up Uh, six to eight millimeters, uh, one CT at six to twelve months, then eighteen to twenty-four months. If unchanged, discharge to uh, from follow-up. If there are multiple nodules, that's the other question that you get asked. What if there are multiple nodules? Then you follow up according to the largest size. So if you think all the pathology is the same and there are multiple nodules, then look at the largest size and use that to apply to the guideline. Okay, so you follow up according to the largest size. uh if there is one or more risk of lung cancer in an spn less than this thing uh, less than 8 mm uh, then less than 4 mm 12 months so we have shifted the guidelines to one or uh, one row to the left so less than 4 mm this is less than 8 mm okay so less than 4 mm one ct at 12 months no change discharge 4 to 6 mm 6 to 12 months one ct 18 to 24 months second ct and then discharge 4 to 6 mm no change no more follow up okay that's important this is 6 to 8 mm one ct at 3 to 6 months then one ct at 9 to 12 months and then 20 i'm sorry this line is actually from the previous uh, guideline this line please ignore this one this 4 to 6 mm ignore that okay that's by mistake so it is 4 to 6 mm 6 to 8 mm and multiple nodules follow up according to the largest size okay is it clear all right so now ggos have a different pathway so far everything that we spoke was either solid or part solid it's important to understand that so we have spoken about solid and part solid nodules ggos are defined according to less than 5 mm or more than 5 mm so there is a difference in the management if it is a ggo so if ggo is there you use the cut off of less than 5 mm no further evaluation okay and if the ggo is more than 5 mm then you need a annual surveillance for at least 3 years okay and you got to look at both the non solid and solid component if any of this increases in size 
then you need to do a CT guided biopsy or you need to operate on them. Okay. A early three month follow up for non solid more than 10 millimeters. So GGOs more than 10 millimeters do one CT at three months. That is the difference here. This is a difference from the other guidelines that I told you. So GGO less than five millimeters, more than five millimeters, less than five millimeters, no need for follow up more than five millimeters. You need an annual surveillance for at least three years. So repeat a CT every year for three years. If it grows at any point of these three years, you have to repeat the, you have to do a needle biopsy or you have to do a surgical resection. If it is more than 10 millimeters GGO, then you have to do an early CT. This is the first time you're doing a CT at three months, okay? So this is different from the others. And if there is any change, you must do a non-surgical biopsy or surgery. Did this make sense, what I just told you? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. yes, sir. Very important, okay? Very important. So it's a different thing. So we've spoken about this, okay? If it's more than 50% CT surveillance, we spoke about this. We, we spoke about part solid more than 50% ground glands. Surveillance at 3, 12, and 24 months. So if it's more than 50% surveillance and annual surveillance for further one to three years, it's very important. Okay. So a part solid GGO, which has got more than 50% ground glass, you must do 3, 12, and 24 months follow up. So anytime you have a GGO, the whole thing changes. You start worrying about it because GGOs are representative of adenocarcinomas as opposed to a solid tumor. So solid tumor is four, less than four, four to six, six to, six to eight. GGOs are less than five, more than five. And the third classification is less than 50% ground glass or more than 50% ground glass. And whenever there's more than 50% ground glass, there is a worry that this is a cancer. And so the surveillance pattern changes. You increase the surveillance frequency and you continue it for at least three years. That is the important thing, okay? And what is considered malignancies if the part solid grows or the tumor becomes more solid. So a GGO with 50% ground glass, more than 50% ground glass and 50% part solid, the GGO part starts to become solid. If it starts to become solid, even if the size has not changed, but the GGO is starting to become solid, then you have to think malignancy. Did, did you understand? This is different concept. We are not talking about change in the size here. We're talking about the solidity. So if the part solid becomes solid, then there is a chance that this is a malignancy. Most of the times this will be associated with growth in size. But even if there is no growth inside, but the GGO has actually started becoming solid, you must worry that this is malignancy and you must do a needle biopsy. Is this clear? Did you understand this? This is a different concept, okay? GGOs yes. run a different pathway. Yes, okay. yes sir. All right. So <clears throat> part solid, pure GGO, but nodule is more than eight millimeters. What do you do? CT surveillance at three months. If nodule persists, please go ahead and uh, do surgery. Okay, do, do a needle biopsy or surgery. So with GGOs, we are very worried. We are very worried. It's a big GGO and it is not resolving. Then one CT at three months. And if it is not resolved, it's not gone away because GGOs can be inflammatory or cancer. If it is inflammatory, it will resolve. No, no doubt about it. But if it is not resolving on your CT, then please in a large nodule, go ahead and do a CT guided biopsy. Do a PET scan non-surgical biopsy and or surgery, depending on whatever you think is there. What do you do if one or more nodules are detected? Then we said that uh, the, if you are doing a pathway follow-up, if you're doing a CT scan uh, survey follow-up, then the largest nodule size should be considered and that should follow. If you are want to know, uh, you have to actually look at each nodule. If all nodules are the same, that's okay. If each nodule is different, then you've got to make sure that this is not metastasis. It's quite important, okay? So if you're thinking of metastasis, uh, do a biopsy in multiple nodules. And definitely one of that nodule may be a lung cancer. So be careful about it. You've got to evaluate each nodule carefully. Don't just say that 
this is metastasis or this is uh, benign and one nodule is of a different pathology. You have to evaluate each nodule carefully, look at it, look at the shape, size. If all nodules are the same size, everything looks benign, that's okay. But if one nodule looks different, then follow the pathway for that nodule. It is a different uh, management system, okay? So do not de deny somebody a curative surgery because the other nodules are benign. So that is the point that they're trying to make in this. Did you understand this? So multiple nodules, same type, the largest size is what matters. Multiple nodules, different types, then evaluate each nodule separately. Did you understand that? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. Good. So there are two scenarios in nodules, okay? It's not just one scenario. There are two scenarios. Okay, so this is the multiple nodule pathway. And, uh, you know, if the nodule has got predominantly ground glass, then it is multifocal GGO, always very high risk of cancer. Okay, or with uh, or nodule with a typical image of cancer, always keep this in mind. And please go ahead, either repeat a CT at three months or biopsy them straight away. So that is what this pathway says. And then if it is here, then you, you got to look at histology. If it is similar, then it is more likely to be, oh, come on, sorry. If it is similar, then it's more likely to be the same type of cancer and it is intrapulmonary metastasis. The problem is here. If the histology is different, then think of a second primary. So if you've got two nodules, don't assume that it is metastasis. That's the point of this slide. The point of the slide is that if it is two nodules, you biopsy both nodules. Or if it is two nodules in two lungs, one in the right lower lobe, one in the left upper lobe, somebody with a previous history of squamous cell cancer of the throat or the larynx, what do you do? One nodule in the right upper lobe, one nodule in the left upper lobe. Do you call this as metastasis from the laryngeal cancer? No, you have to actually do histology. You have to biopsy both the nodules. The biopsy may be come back as similar or it may come back as different. If it's different, then you have to think of a second primary. Okay, it's very important. And if the biopsy comes back as similar, then go down into the uh, immunohistochemistry and try to identify which is the predominant type. And that will give you an idea whether this is intrapulmonary metastasis or is it a second primary. This is a very, very difficult scenario. But all of this must be discussed in the MGT. It is absolutely mandatory that when you get two nodules in two separate lungs with a previous history of a cancer, you have to differentiate whether is this a prime, a new second primary? Number two, is this metastasis from the lung cancer? Or number three, one is a primary and one is a metastasis. Very difficult scenario. And you have to actually work very hard to look at the histology and look at the immunohistochemistry. Do not, on the basis of radiology, call it metastasis. That's the point they're trying to make in this, okay? So until and unless you've been through this pathway, you cannot call it a pulmonary metastasis. That is very important to understand. Now, a <coughs> couple of points of BTS which are very important, which have not been included in the ACCP guideline. So BTS has used these grades of recommendation but some particular points which I want to highlight, which are very well written in the BTS, uh, things about surgical biopsy. So BTS has recommended VATS, which the ACCP has also recommended. But the other important thing is that if you are there on the table and you, uh, you've got a nodule, you take the nodule, send it for frozen section, and if it comes back positive, you can do a definitive lobectomy in the same anesthesia. This is part of the guidelines, okay? It's been mentioned in the BTS guideline. So that's absolutely fine. So you can wedge, you can frozen section and proceed to lobectomy. And this one is if it's a very deep nodule and you cannot get a frozen section and you've discussed with the patient preoperatively, you can do a definitive lobectomy purely to get diagnosis, not therapy. So both have been mentioned, okay? These two scenarios are clearly mentioned in the guideline. So you're absolutely okay to do either of them, provided the patient has agreed to it. The patient has to agree to this, okay? And more importantly, the BTS guidelines is the only guidelines which talks about anatomical segmentectomy. 
that is recommended if you if for a solitary pulmonary nodule particularly when you are talking about a patient who has got uh, compromised lung function or even in patient with normal lung function anatomical segmentectomy is now coming up as a treatment because uh, because there is very good uh, evidence that segmentectomy may give you very good results uh, or as good results as definitive lobectomy okay this is a change in the guide this is not a change this is different from the accp guidelines this is a more in depth analysis of what to do as a surgeon so it's directly from the guidelines that i'm saying uh, diagnostic anatomical segmentectomy is without nodal disease that's the important thing if you've got nodal disease then anatomical segmentectomy is not the answer and you can do it if frozen section is not possible okay so if there's no nodal disease if frozen section is not possible go ahead and do a segmentectomy rather than a wedge take out the tumor and send it away and that that's all that you need to do okay uh, intraoperative localization tools are highly recommended uh, during this uh, procedure uh, you have to use whatever is available in your hospital but try and localize the nodule very clearly and it has spoken about sublobar resections for ggm so again uh, segmentectomies and uh, sub segmentectomies have been spoken of uh, and we are talking about anatomical not non anatomical so this is the only guideline which actually talks about the various surgical tools that are available to you as a surgeon so you can use any or all of these what do you do uh what is the non surgical treatment without pathological diagnosis that means if a patient is unfit for surgery what do you do so if a patient is unfit for surgery and he's got a solitary pulmonary nodule but you cannot uh, get a histology then you are okay to do a, a sabr stereotactic uh, body radiotherapy or an rfa ablation even without histology as long as the patient agrees Uh, the other option, if he's unfit for surgery or he's unfit for SABR or RFA, then you have an option for radical radiotherapy. Level of evidence is low, level of recommendation is low, but these are very rare cases that you will see. But there is a backup in literature which says that if you cannot do SABR, you cannot do RFA, you cannot do surgery, and you don't have a histology, if the patient is agreeable, you can subject them to radical radiotherapy. most important thing is there is no role for inhaled corticoids in the treatment of spm don't uh, start using corticosteroids and say that uh, i'm trying to evaluate the effect of corticosteroids on spm does it go down or not there is no role for that you have to either uh, do a ct guided biopsy or you got to do surgery or you got to follow them up by ct there is no role for using inhaled corticosteroids or antibiotic use in the treatment of spm you know you cannot either you are sure of your diagnosis and you use therapeutic antibiotics or you are unsure of your diagnosis you cannot use prophylactic antibiotics to see if the spm is resolving with antibiotics that is not recommended okay and that is very clearly mentioned in the guidelines a lot of people in india do that they see a solitary pulmonary nodule and they say ah let's start him on uh, anti tuberculous therapy or let's start him on this thing that is not recommended you got to be sure of the diagnosis before you do that okay so this is uh, i showed you this before this is all pretty clear i'm repeating these slides uh, just for completion okay so less than 8 more than 8 very low intermediate high and then you do whatever we said you do this is the same slide i've repeated because after the whole talk you must be able to understand this slide these are the three slides that you have to clearly understand but you cannot understand it until and unless you read the guidelines okay and this is the third one okay 4 4 to 6 6 to 8 less than 4 4 to 6 6 to 8 the same thing is repeated in the acgp guidelines as well this is based on accp uh, accp guidelines acgp paper this paper is for general practitioners and again they have said 8 to 30 low probability intermediate probability high probability my problem is just here because they are talking about surgery directly from high probability i would still do a pet scan in there okay i'd still do a pet scan and if the patient wants i would do a fnac and then depending on what it is uh, you will then go ahead with uh, vats but if the patient says i don't want a pet scan i don't want this thing then you are allowed to go to vats okay so this is the two things less than 8 mm is exactly the same so this is it less than 4 4 to 6 6 to 
less than four, four to six, six to eight, but everything has moved one step to the right. So what was here has gone here, what was here has gone here, and a new one has come up, come up here, okay? Just take a snapshot of this, or if you want, I'll share these, uh, these papers with you. And uh, this is how you identify each one of them. What are the other guidelines available in the market? Uh, there's the Fleshner Society guideline, which was published in 2017. There is the NCCN guidelines, which is published in 2017. There's the BTS guidelines, which was published in 2015. And there is an Asian modified guidelines, which was published in 2019. Um, the chest recommends that guidelines should be adapted to local settings. Uh, hence, you can develop your own local guidelines to identify local strengths and challenges, and particularly in Asia because of high incidence of inflammatory diseases. So a group of us got together. Uh, I was actually involved in this. Uh, I was involved in this management. Um, I am one of the authors in this paper where we looked at guidelines on uh, in Asia, and uh, we actually wrote this paper in chest. Uh, it is not a guideline, it's a consensus statement. So it's a consensus guideline where uh, the pulmonology, the radiotherapist, uh, there were three surgeons, Jia Alami, uh, Zhang Ming, and Anthony Yin, and uh, a lot more people actually. This is uh, just one group. So we were at least 20, 25 people who sat over two years and we went through all the evidence and we tried to evaluate pulmonary guidelines with relation to Asia. So if you want, you can use these guidelines for your exams. But personally, I would say use the ACCP guidelines and a little bit from the BTS, as I showed you. But you can, uh, you must remember that these guidelines have been adapted for Asia. So you can look at these guidelines to understand what are the subtle changes. I won't go into more detail, otherwise the lecture will never end. Uh, the other things, uh, other literature available out there, which has looked at guidelines, our lung rads, which is lung CT screening, reporting, and data systems, and uh, uh, IEL CAP, okay, which is the International Early Lung Cancer Action Project. These guys have also put out some recommendations for guidelines. So when we ask you in the exam, what are the other guidelines that you're aware of? You must say BTS, NCCN, Fleshner Society, uh, lung rads, IEL, uh, IEL CAP, and um, the Asian guidelines that are recommended there. Now, just a quick look at the other guidelines, not in great detail. I'm not going to go through each one of them. But Fleshner's has, uh, the four millimeter is not there. It's more of six millimeter, six to eight millimeter, and more than eight millimeter. Okay, that's the difference between Fleshner and ACCP. Uh, again, uh, the ground glass thing, they have less than six and more than six. Whereas the ACCP is less than five and more than five. Uh, NCCN is pretty, it's, uh, is, is uh, similar to the ACCP, except the difference is that less than four is not there. They are looking at six millimeters, okay? So six, less than six, six to eight, and more than eight. And then uh, for the non-solid, they're talking about 20 mm. So less than 20 and more than 20 mm. So it's a slightly different pathway. This is 2017. Uh, so the reality, there are many, many guidelines. Uh, you must pick one and follow one. That is the important thing, okay? So many guidelines are available. There are specific guidelines for Asia. I'm very happy to share these with you. Uh, again, I can't do two or three guidelines in the same lecture. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll get very confused. And uh, the Asian guidelines are modification to ACCP. As long as you know ACCP, and then browse through the Asian guidelines, you will understand what are the modifications that we have done. Thank you very much, guys. Almost two hours. Okay. All right. Let me stop sharing. Okay. Did that make sense to you guys? I'm sorry. It was very, very yes. uh, intensive. Uh, but uh, I tried to go through it in a, in a pattern so that everybody understands uh, what we are talking about. We have a full house, by the way. Excellent. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. So I am going to take some questions. Uh, if you want, you can send me questions on the WhatsApp. One minute, I have to get my phone. Uh, it is here. And if you want, you can uh, ask me questions. So one by one, raise your hand. And I may not see everybody's hand, but raise your hand and I'll try and answer some questions. Very, very complex topic, but I've tried to simplify as best as I can. 
Okay, so uh, any questions on the WhatsApp? Yes, I don't know. Sir. Ask me the questions, guys. Fitun, go ahead and ask me. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't find the raise hand. It's disappeared. Uh, it's okay. sir, actually, I have two questions. So one of them, you talked about antibiotics for SPN. Uh, how about if you have ground glass opacity, would you also not consider the antibiotics? They're not part of the guidelines, but if you clinically feel that the patient has got uh, got infection, then treat it as a therapeutic uh, treatment, not as a prophylactic antibiotic. It's, it cannot be used to evaluate a, a GGO. That's what they're saying. They're saying, don't use it to evaluate a GGO. That let's give antibiotics and see what the result is. If you clinically feel that the patient's got high fever, he's got infl he's got uh, raised white cell count, uh, ESR is raised, uh, and there is uh, evidence of infection, then use therapeutic treatment. Don't. Yes, uh, but not as a it's test. not part of the yeah, it's not part of the guidelines. Yeah. You cannot repeat okay. a CT scan uh, on the basis of the guidelines. Then it's out of, outside the guidelines. But you can okay. use antibiotic if you believe that he's got infection. Infection then. Yeah. And the other question is, we talked about multiple nodules. So I got confused. If we have multiple nodules, why we still consider SPM? They are not SPM. They are not, they are not called as solitary pulmonary nodules. But the guidelines has to address because we face them in our clinical uh, life, uh, lifestyle every day. We, we, we all face uh, a situation where you may not have a single nodule. You, you have more than one nodule. So then the guidelines have said that look at the nodules. If they all look the same uh, by CT characterization, then follow up the patient on the basis of the largest nodule. So if there is, they're all the same, then follow up on the basis of the largest nodule. If they look different, each nodule you have to look at. And if they look different, then it's a separate pathology. So you have to biopsy all of, uh, you know, whichever are the different ones, one of this, one of that. So follow up on CT basis if they're all the same. If they are different, then you have to characterize it on two separate pathways. It's not one pathway, it's two separate pathways. Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? These are oh, very yes. difficult yes. clinical situations. When there's multiple nodules, the best thing is going to the uh, MDT and take an MDT opinion and you'll be safe because okay. it's very difficult to know. And like I told you that example where if you've got previous laryngeal carcinoma and then you did a CT scan on follow-up, one nodule in the right upper lobe, one nodule in the left lower lobe. What do you do? Do you call it metastasis? If you call it metastasis, that's the end of the story. But it may not be metastasis. It may be a second primary squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, which could be treatable. Yes. Or one could be metastasis, one could be a second primary. So it's very, very important to biopsy both and put them through immunohistochemistry. So these are very complex scenarios. Needs a lot of thinking before you can make a decision on these patients. There is no clear cut answer. You might change uh, from patient to patient. I see. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah, thanks. Uh, somebody else raised a hand. Uh, let me look at the chats, okay? Uh, yes, Dr. Shukla. Yeah, can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir, we can hear you very well. Thank you. Yeah, a very nice presentation. Only two things I want to say. Please do. The first thing is that whenever these boys, the students are shown an X-ray with a solitary pulmonary nodule, mm -hmm. this, was, this is what exactly happened to me with my exams during my exams with Victor Solomon. I was allowed to ask only one question after the X-ray was put up. Mm. And the answer to the entire thing was he wanted me to ask him whether there's a previous x-ray of the patient very good very important point that is the first line of the guideline so they have to know that the solitary pulmonary nodule management starts with the previous x-ray not with the x-ray which has been shown to them absolutely sir very important point dr shukla very important point and it is actually point, the yeah, yeah it is the no, first please line complete. of the guideline yeah. And the second my important point was this misconception the students have of their tumor doubling time. They think that when a one centimeter mass becomes two centimeter, the tumor has doubled. No. If a one centimeter mass becomes 1.2 centimeters, the tumor has doubled. But 
point two or uh, two millimeter increase in size means the tumor has doubled, which you very rightly kept insisting all the time. A two millimeter increase, a two millimeter increase. It actually means that the tumor has doubled in size. Absolutely, absolutely. The student shouldn't think that a one centimeter diameter becomes two centimeters. Then only it has doubled. No, one centimeter becoming one point two five. The tumor has doubled. So the, that is why the guidelines have suggested that you use a volumetric analysis. Correct. Rather than using a diametric analysis, you use a volumetric analysis. And if you look at the volume of a 1.2 centimeter tumor versus the volume of a one centimeter tumor, it will be doubled. See, at your level and exactly my level, the point the that you're saying is at your level and my level, it is very easy to understand. But at the MCS level. they have to get this clear in their mind that the tumor doesn't double when 1 cm becomes 2 absolutely sir thank very you very point. much sir very good thank point you. dr shukla thank, thank you for you. your input thank you very much excellent next question next question please uh, yeah amol you raised your hand amol hello sir can you hear me please yeah i can hear you yeah sir i have got some questions regarding pet scan uh, bts says that uh, pet scan is, uh, pet scan uh, characterization can be done by herder model so herder yes. model is a independent independent uh, uh, risk assessment model or it is only for pet it's predominantly for pet actually it's used as a if you look at the paper of the herder model they have analyzed it on the basis yes, of pet yeah. yes sir sir uh, the sir the other question is uh, if uh, solitary pulmonary nodule is uh, seated deep inside uh, near the central airways and all so uh, how it would change the surgical uh, method of taking it out if it is a very deep seated thing then there are uh, you have either localization methods so you use a localization yes. method um, and you see if you can highlight the solitary pulmonary if it is not possible then you can do what is called as a true cut biopsy on table for frozen section and again if it is yes, not sir. possible then you can do a segmentectomy to uh, get that nodule out if that is not possible then you can actually do a definitive lobectomy but this discussion must happen pre operatively not on table on table you yes, cannot sir. decide to take a lobectomy to do a lobectomy and the solitary pulmonary nodule comes back as benign that is uh, litigious if yes. you do that you are in trouble so the pre operative discussion is extremely important and so there are four options one is true cut one is uh, anatomical segmentectomy or even a lobectomy that that's the bottom line it's a very difficult situation sometimes i i have known surgeons who have done uh, a dissection into the parenchyma of the lung to get to the lesion so they have actually cut into the lung and dissected it open and got to the lesion usually in these cases it is okay to do that when you are dealing with the hamartoma or something like that but when you are dealing with malignancy it's very difficult to get to that lesion uh, surgically so then you have to actually wedge it out or resect it out so deep seated tumors are yes. a real problem and you really need to need to understand uh, how to get to it it's not it's not easy You need to be a good yes, surgeon. Sir. sir, one last question. And, sir. and remember, Amol, you are doing this by wax. That's the other thing. Yes, sir. yes. Okay. <laughs> That's what I asked this question, sir. It might be very difficult to. Uh, It is very difficult. And if you are, but the thing with yeah. wax is, if you can't do any of this by wax, you must open. That is the only indication to convert a wax into open. But you must start with wax. That is what the guidelines say. But if you need to open, you need to open. You need to do what is right for the patient. Not uh, access is not important. What you do inside is. is better to open and actually get the lesion than to do by wax and miss the lesion you understand that so this philosophy has to be very clear yes, in your mind okay yes, next uh, sir like 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 uh, like in definitions we said that uh, uh, um, pleural effusion and other lung parenchymal diseases are like they are not included in the definition but uh, uh, emphysema and bullous disease uh, can be called the lesion as uh, spn if it goes this with uh, emphysema and bullous disease yeah yeah you can yeah you can emphysema yes. is not part of uh, emphysema you can, 90% or at least yes. 50% of people in india will have emphysema so <laughs> you cannot ignore them they are they are definitely yes. part of the thing. 
thank you sir thank emphysema you. doesn't matter if it's emphysema it doesn't matter that's the correct pathology yes yeah who wants to come in next vikas i love your background you've learned from me <laughs> tell me are we supposed to i mean in day to day clinical practice do we follow this borax model or hudders model for quantification i mean yes you do yes you do Uh, we, so we are not supposed to know in see, because when we when we sit in mdts we are always follow these models so we need to know the, these three uh, uh, stratification yeah. models most of the times it is a very good, easy way to stratify on on clinical basis there is if you if you read the guidelines the first statement says that on clinical judgment you can do that on clinical just one minute i'll take that no one minute hello Uh, Manisha, can I call you back? I'm on online uh, video call. Thanks, thanks. Okay, thanks. Bye, bye. Yeah, tell me. No, you answered my questions and my doubts. Okay, yes. so so the first line says clinical judgment. The second line says predictor models. Okay, who else wants to ask me a question? Uh, one, oh, one more question. Uh, okay, yeah, because. All the chapters we read for SP, and we find that there is a previous colorectal cancer, and then a previous uh, renal cell cancer, and they all gives what is the probability, what what are the um, uh, prognostic factors. It is very confusing. So we are supposed to know more than disease-free interval. This much this cancer that, is that, good prognostic. That, that is number. That is. I have another uh, talk on pulmonary metastatectomy. Uh, we'll discuss that in that talk. I'll tell you all about it. Okay. Sir. Yeah, that's a separate topic actually. It's not related to SPN. It's pulmonary metastatectomy. What are the philosophy behind pulmonary metastatectomy? How to decide which patient will undergo surgery? Who will benefit from the surgery? Things like that. That's a different philosophy. Shashi Karan, come in. Can I can I ask questions? Bishwal. Uh, Shashi Karan. Shashi Karan has yeah, raised yeah, his hand. Come in. Hi sir. One minute, Bishwal. Uh, I'll call you back in a second. Yeah, uh, sir. I was uh, when when we are doing a VATS guided VATS biopsy, is it necessary mm-hmm. that uh, if you are not able to take out the whole uh, uh, lesion, can we just uh, take a small uh, tissue and take it for frozen, or uh, if, if it is not possible, uh, we should convert and then do the remove the whole lesion as such? See, if you are if you want just for frozen section, you can even send a true cut. so you you can just put in a needle and send for true cut if you've got a good pathologist on true cut he will tell you whether it's cancer or not cancer uh, if he he might come back and tell you inadequate tissue or not cancer then i'll take some more biopsies because i want to get representative area but most of the times if i'm doing it by rats i will actually take out the whole lesion and send it off i never try to cut through the lesion that's not a good uh, that's not a good philosophy in lung cancer the last thing i want to do is uh, breach the lesion uh, intrapleurally so i always try to take the whole lesion and send it away it's only the problem when it is deep seated that is when you when you have an issue uh, because i want to actually take a decision whether should i continue with lobectomy or not so i will wait for the frozen section to come back uh, most of the time they'll come back and say it is cancer and that's okay you continue with lobectomy and systematic nodal dissection sometimes they come back and say it's inconclusive or i am not sure on frozen section in that situation i will close the patient and i will wait for the formal histology and there have been some situations where the formal histology came back as cancer and i scheduled the patient for a second procedure for a completion lobectomy so it, the, but these are all discussions you have to have before the surgery so that after the surgery patient doesn't get very agitated or wild whenever we have small lesions in the lung we always have a very detailed discussion with the patient talking about all these clinical factors and all scenarios and it is very often you come across where the frozen section comes back negative or inconclusive that's very difficult for a surgeon but if you have already discussed with the patient before before surgery then you can always close and come back a second time the worst thing is if the frozen section is inconclusive and you do a lobectomy and then the histology comes back as benign that is indefensible that is medical negligence so you know don't proceed to a lobectomy if you think it is benign disease as far as possible lobectomy is not the treatment for benign disease that is why they say segmentectomy you understand so at least segmentectomy you can defend uh, lobectomy you cannot defend i i know of at least two cases in india where patients have had uh, lobectomies 
and uh, the histology came back as TB, and the patient sued the surgeon. I have been called in as expert witness. At least two cases, and you know it's a real problem. It's a real problem. And when somebody sues you, your life is hell because there's so much paperwork. You may have done everything right, but still there is so much paperwork. And then you have an expert like me coming in, uh, who may be on your side or who may be the defense side. <laughs> it is very difficult. It's, so you got to be very careful about what you're doing on table. Nowadays, people are very litigious because of uh, Google and internet. They're reading. Even the most innocuous looking guy who comes from the village actually is reading the stuff and he can take you to court. Okay, next question. Uh, who was there? Biswarup was there. Yeah. Sir, sir, you partly answered the question. Uh, I was asking if it is a more than 8 million solitary pulmonary nodule in a patient who is high risk to have cancer, but his PET or other imaging shows that he does not have any other extra pleural metastasis. In that case, if the frozen section comes to be inconclusive, uh, do we go by the BTS guideline and do a segmentectomy for that patient or do we do we oh, uh, you, wait for a histopathology for this no, patient? No, no, no. The segmentectomy that has been advised is for diagnostic purpose, not therapeutic. So okay. if you have wedged it out and send yes. it for frozen section and it has come back negative, you got to stop. Put in a drain and go home. And <laughs> okay. If it you is inconclusive, sir. You cannot, yeah. If it is inconclusive, put in a drain and go home. As long as you've got a sample. The purpose of the VATS is sampling. Whether you get it by wedge or you get it by segmentectomy, that is different. But you cannot say, I wedged it out. The frozen section came back as uh, negative and I did a segmentectomy. You cannot justify that. The problem is the thought process. The sequence is not justifiable. Okay. Next, who wants to ask another question? Anybody else wants to ask any more questions? It's a very good thing. You got Dr. Shukla as well here with us, who will answer some questions. Use this advantage. Come on. No more. Okay. Thank you very one, much, everybody. I one, hope it was quite question. clear. Yeah. One last question. Who is that? One last question. Uh, in that uh, Asian adaptation, uh, I identify yourself because we don't know who you are. Uh, so this is Andre. This is Andre. Uh, Hi, Andre, I can't see. It's too dark. I can't see you. <laughs> sir, all right. Sir. Hi, Andre. Tell me. Yeah. Now we can. Uh, see. Uh, that paper, uh, that Asian adaptation uh, paper from chest. Yeah. So I uh, was uh, carrying an impression that uh, uh, recommendations 5.1 and 5.2 uh, in uh, par solid nodules, where you have settled on CT surveillance, it is okay to uh, push in uh, antimicrobials. Because we'd, we'd be that is, that is, no, no, that is the Asian adaptation. That is the Asian adaptation where we have actually come in and said that you can do antimicrobials if you are definitive of the diagnosis. It cannot be used as a surveillance method. I, I know which point you're talking about. This was discussed heavily uh, in the Asian adaptation of the thing. We actually said you can use antimicrobials as a therapy, not as a follow-up. Okay. Because, you know, because it cannot be used to diagnose. You cannot okay. use uh, antibiotics to diagnose whether is he responding or not responding. Okay. You understand that? You can use it as a therapy. There's a difference between the two terminologies. But we, we actually put it in there because there is this complex uh, problems in India where you get inflammatory responses. So we said that it's okay to use it as a therapy, not as a, not as a follow-up uh, me me method. Because no, nowhere have but, you but, said that. But, but but that if you look at it carefully, the level of evidence is very low for that. Achha, okay, sir. Okay. The level of evidence is it is on D expert opinion. All right. Yeah. No, we 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 tried to change these to suit the Asian this thing, but uh, the level of evidence is not great on that. So we cannot uh, in a general lecture I cannot uh, say that you should use antibiotics as a routine this thing only for therapy not for not for evaluation of a spm right got it thank you sir amol uh, thanks good to see you andre yes thank you sir uh, sir, uh, sir this is uh, this is regarding palpation of the nodule sir how much does it add to the uh, information of a surgeon and how important it is to palpate the nodule sir 
very not important. possible uh, usually very 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 important and uh, if somebody is trained with me i promise you they will tell you that you can palpate every part of the lung there is absolutely no nodule that you cannot palpate by rads there is a technique to it uh, just putting in a finger is not required you need to actually mobilize the whole lung and the lung has come has got to come to the finger not finger go to the lung palpation is very important it is mandatory because if you are looking for spn you might find another nodule in a lower lobe very often you will see because ct sensitivity is for less than 1 mm uh, for more than 1 cm so anything uh, less than 1 cm you may not pick up on a ct so it is very important to palpate but nowadays with the localization techniques available on vats platform uh it it has become easier to find the spn but you still have to palpate i palpate the whole lung and i palpate the lung segment by segment by vats so and again uh, the philosophy is the lung comes to the finger the finger cannot go to the lung yes sir. so you you push in your finger as much as possible and then the whole lung has to be mobilized including releasing inferior pulmonary ligament releasing anterior hilum releasing posterior hilum so that the lung picks up and comes towards the hand so you have to learn the technique you cannot say it's a, it's a fallacy of the technique it's a fallacy of the surgeon if he doesn't know how to pulp it uh, yes sir the so, continuation with amol's uh, this thing uh, question so you have a uh, talk on the same topic as well uh, what talk <laughs> it's the same thing how to pulp it and localize Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have done this. The we we would like to something on localization techniques. <laughs> oh, very good! It's an excellent topic, actually. I have got yeah. it. I've done, I've done this uh, lecture in a con in a in a internationally. I heard this lecture, so yeah. Yes, sir. I I'll, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. The yes. Localization technique is very important to understand. There are various types of things that are available. I I need to do endobronchial surgery with you as well. So I, I'll someday we'll talk about all these things. Okay. what else quick questions thank you very much guys we are 2 hours and 15 minutes i think that was very well done uh, you guys are doing pretty good i'm going to stop recording.